Hello, Donna here. Uh, welcome to my channel. Thank you for, uh, for stopping in. Now, today's little tutorial, and it's going to be a shorty. It won't be terribly long. I don't think, but I always say that, and they end up getting long. Uh, but I don't intend for it to be really long because it's such a simple process. Now, this is an imitative process, how to make uh, your clay look like just a simple stone. Uh, I'm not trying to imitate anything in particular. I just want something that gives a sort of natural, more natural stony appearance. And um, whether it looks exactly like something in nature or not, really it doesn't, doesn't quite matter to me. Now this tutorial is also for those of you who are really beginning, just beginning. You've discovered polymer clay. You know you can bake it in the oven. You might know you can bake it more than once. You know certain things that you can do with it. Um, but you're still on that road to really learning and understanding what the clay can do for you. And you know what, let me say, uh, I've been on this road 30 years and I still learn more about clay. So it, it isn't, there is no real ending, I don't think, once you get really involved in clay. Now, today all we're gonna need is translucent clay. And this is my translucent that I had a whole bunch of little bits of clay. I mean, here, I'll show you. I just took this, which which is translucent clay. It's just been sitting around, and it was really, really hard. So I added some conditioning bar, and then I got bored, and I set it aside. And uh, it's been just sitting around for, like, weeks, I think. But an interesting thing happened. That conditioning clay seems to have permeated the harder clay. So it was much, much easier for me to uh, to actually roll it into sheets without bits and pieces of it falling off. So uh, maybe next time I'll do that. If I get some clay that's really, really hard and I wanna soften it, I'll put the conditioning in. I'll just leave it in a blob like this, set it aside and come back in a week. I'll see. If it works, I'll tell you. Okay, then you're gonna need embossing powders. Now, these are embossing powders and if you do any work with paper, um, card making, art cards, whatever. You probably know exactly what this is. You use it on paper. Now this is some kind of terracotta color. This is actually a verdigris. And this is the verdigris. This is the color I used here. So you can see that even though it's quite blue as a powder, when you cure it, it turns more green. Now also, I want you to look closely at the flecking. So you can see that there are many different flecks in there. You'll find dark, you find light, you might even find white and black. Primarily, it's that blue-green color, but you'll also find a few little metallic flecks as well. Okay, and that's what it looks like when it is infused into translucent clay and then the translucent clay is baked. Now, I believe this is the color I used, but I could be wrong. I made this piece many, many, many years ago. Long, long time ago. But I think it might... Uh-uh, nope, it's not. Because if you look at this powder, you can see that pretty uniformly it's one type of fleck. Maybe, maybe something's a little darker and a little lighter. But if you look at the actual piece I made, I can see black in there and I can see some white in there. So whatever I used to make this reddish orange color was not this powder. It's okay, I'm gonna use this anyway. Now this is just a solid donut of the verdigris that I then uh, antiqued with oil paint. Now you can see that there's quite a large crack here running through. Well, that tends to happen too because I'm taking something dry and I'm packing it into this clay. And then when it heats up, I don't really know um, much about embossing powders, the way they actually react with the heat. But I'm finding that, yes, you do get cracking. But then again, I'm looking to make something that has a more natural appearance. And the cracks don't really bother me at all. Okay. 
so I've got these two colors and I just wanted to show you another one. This is actually Tim Holtz's uh, old paper and his powders are quite beautiful and there's a lot of interesting flecking in there. So you could try those as well. Here's another one of his and this is quite pretty. I think it's called tea dye. I've not tried these. Maybe I'll try. You know what? Maybe I'll just try these today. Okay. I mean, you've seen what the green looks like. Let's do something a little different. Why not? Why not? I'm game. Okay, so these are brand new. I mean, they've... Last time I did this was many, many years ago. So these powders have been in my barn. Picking up dust. Collecting dust. Oh yeah, these are really pretty. Really pretty. I think they'll be really lovely together. Okay, so I've got this and it's quite soft. You know, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to shake some of this powder right there, right on it. Now, I'm going to put more powder in, but I'm not going to put all of it in at once because it can get quite messy. So I'm going to fold it over and I'm just forming a little pocket. And now I'm going to roll it through the pasta machine. Okay. I'm going to fold it and roll a few times. I think I will thin the sheet out. So that now I'm rolling it through setting number two. You can see my machine had a little bit of yellow there. I must have been Oh yeah, I was making some chains, had yellow on them. I'm not real concerned about that because I don't think whatever schmutz is on the rollers is going to have much effect on this, but I did just wipe it down. All right, so let's keep going. So this is where we are so far. The one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to take and take this dry powder and try to infuse it into clay that isn't a little bit on the sticky side. You want it to be a little softer rather than harder. So my tr uh, translucent, all of my clays tend to be a little stiffer. For this process, I would add the conditioning bar to make it softer and stickier. Because as I add this powder, the clay becomes drier. It it uh, develops a drier sheen um, feel. Excuse me. So let's add a little more. Fold it over. Make that little packet. I'm going to get rid of that little piece of black clay. And I'm going to continue folding and rolling. So I will be back when I've infused that much in, and we'll take a look. All right, I'm back, and this is what I have. I'm gonna get rid of that little bit of fuzz. And this is what I have. Now, I think what I'll do is just take a, I'm gonna cut a piece off like that, just like this, and we'll cure this. This is after the second, um, the second uh, bunch of uh, embossing powder that I worked in. So let's see what that looks like when it's cured. But I'm going to put in a third. So I'm just going to set that aside there. And we're going to put a little more powder in. And I'm going to work that through. Okay, so I'll be back after I work that through. I don't think you have to sit here and listen to my machine. So I'll be back. Okay, that's after the third, the third uh, application, not application, the third, the third embossing powder mix in. Okay, so let's do a fourth. And then I will bake the fourth. Okay, so I'm working it in, I'll be back. All right, so this is after the fourth. Here is the second. So you can see this is quite a bit deeper than this one. I'm gonna bake this, as I've said. I will also bake one of these. 
And I think I will uh, add two more. Two more, just like I did before. No, there's another thing you know you should know, and it probably makes perfect sense to you. If I wanted to make this more orange, I would just put this in here. So you can mix these powders up as well. So let me do this. So I'll be back after I've mixed two more bunches of powder in the same clay. Okay, so there you've got the first mix the second time with the two, but you know, it's just a funny unit of measurement. I did two little splashes and worked them in, and then I did two splashes that were about the same, worked them in, and then two splashes. So uh, it's kind of funny. Okay, so anyway, you can see what happens with a little, a little more, and then more yet. So I'm gonna repeat the process with this, and then I'll be back. Okay, so here's what I did. Here is the first one that I showed you, and here's the second one, where I kept adding powder just to make it deeper. Now, the one thing about it is if you look at it, for instance here, uh, there's a lot more powder in there, and that's what's what has deepened the color. Um, and here, of course, you see there's less powder. But there's another way I could also deepen the color. And that is just to take a little bit of, let's say I wanted this more orangey, and I didn't want to add more powder. I could actually tint the base color. The base color in this case is translucent, right? So I could just put a little bit more orange in here the clay orange, not not embossing powder, and that would tint the base color and make the whole thing more orange. If I wanted this more yellow, I could just grab some yellow, put it in here, and just tint the base color that all this powder is floating in. Okay, so I think you understand that. So I am going to bake these, and if you find that you like this process, you probably want to bake samples for yourself. So you have uh, an idea of what's going to happen with these different powders because the powders do not all uh, stay the same color. Now, we may be totally surprised. These two might be totally different colors when they come out. I don't really know. I haven't worked with these before. I just opened them. But we're going to find out. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to skin or blend because I'm going to make a donut. I'm gonna make a donut rather like this one. So I'm gonna skin or blend these two, and then I will be back. If you're not familiar with skin or blend, I've got tutorials up on the process. And uh, if you're just beginning in clay, it is definitely something you wanna know. All right, so. Let me finish this and I will be back. If I can turn it off. What are you doing? So I'm back and I skin or blend it. And you can see, I mean, the colors, it's not um, a real dramatic blend, but I think it, it might be nice, we'll see. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to roll this sheet up, not from one color to the other, but sideways, sort of back on itself, right? Because we're gonna do that plug thing. I'm gonna get rid of that if I can. Okay, so I'm just going to roll it up and roll it up as tightly as I can. Then roll and do the plug which is taking my fingers, rolling from the ends to the middle. So I'm, I keep moving my hands to the middle and you can see what's happening here. It's getting shorter and chubbier in the middle. Like so. And the clay is good and soft so it it moves pretty easily, like so, okay. Now, when I first started in clay, um, imitative work was quite popular. It was this wonderful 
trick you could perform with polymer clay. And there were artists who really did amazing imitative work. I mean, the things that they made look just like jade and just like, you know, whatever stone it was that they were trying to imitate. And I thought that was fun. It was fun. But um, I, I kind of moved off in a different direction. So the most imitative stuff that I do these days is something like this, which is quite simple to do. And um, doesn't really call attention away from what I'm, the whole piece that I might be making. However, you know, this, like this necklace, it's very simple. It's all clay. Um, and I find that I wear it quite a bit. Um, I don't really go anywhere, so I don't really wear much of my jewelry. But when I go out, something like this is just a nice, very basic piece to wear. Um, it's nothing fancy. It's nothing flashy, but I, I really like them. So... And I also find that if I'm making a mixed media piece, which I haven't done in a very long time, uh, I will actually use like real turquoise or real jades, jade beads, things like that. Okay, so I've just kind of shaped a disc, a very thick disc with my fingers. And then now I'm just rolling between my palms like so, I think you can see that. And if I want it to be a little thinner, I'm just going to flatten it between my palms. Like so. Now I need a hole in the middle. So let me grab, that's a little too big, I think. It doesn't have to be a terribly large hole. Let me see, what did I do here? No, oh, that's really teeny tiny hole. So let me just use this Kemper cutter. And try to find the middle, cut straight down. And the cutter is actually too short like that. So you have to take the clay out and then do it twice. Okay. Now, for this particular donut, since the way I thread them and string them, I've got these two end caps, one on either side. It, it, you're never going to see the hole, so the hole doesn't have to be absolutely perfect because I'm not using it that way. Now, if I were going to use the piece as a, a, a donut this way, I think it, it's called it B. It's spelled P-I, but it's pronounced B, I believe. Then, of course, I would have to pay more attention to the quality of the hole because I'm, you would see it, but that's not going to happen here. So I will pay more attention to the parts that are visible in the finished piece. So I'll pinch along the edge, like so. Try to make this as nice and round as possible. Okay, so there we go. I think that's pretty good. And it is a rather thick piece. Once again, if it's too thick for you, just place it in your palms and apply pressure like so evenly. This isn't a race, so you don't have to work so fast. And I think that's fine. As I said, we won't see the hole, so it doesn't have to be perfect. Okay, so now I will cure this, and then I'll be back. And the way I cure it, I'm just going to rest it in uh, baking uh, baking soda so that it won't sag. Okay, there we go, I'll be back. 
All right, so this is cured. Pulled it out of the oven. It's nice and cool now. So you can see what the differences are. You can see how much deeper this got than the original clay, the raw clay. In both cases, this is just deeper than this. And uh, it's really brought out the green on this side, the green and the yellow. This was that first one I did, with, which had the least amount of powder, then the second, and then here is what we ended up with. So you can see it's quite a bit deeper. So, you know, I don't think I could infuse this clay with more powder than I did without creating some problems because the clay would get too dry. So if I wish to make this and I wish to make it deeper, what I would do is add a little more regular clay and tint the base as I talked about before. So here is the pale one. Here is one that's slightly deeper than the deepest one of all. Now, if we look at the actual piece, this side has very little cracking. This side has more cracking than the other side. And I wish I could remember which side was down first. What I did was I put it in the powder. I sunk it in there. I made a well and I put it in. And then about halfway through, I flipped it over. Okay, but this, I'm not really sure. I'm thinking this might have been the top side so that as it was curing, perhaps the piece actually did sag a bit. And if it sagged a bit, maybe it created these little cracks. I'm not, if they don't really bother me at all because I'm going to use the piece as sideways like this. Okay, now I am going to sand it and I'm going to use my Abra net and I will use not the the 80 the 80 is very very coarse uh, i would like to develop kind of a nice soft sheen to the surface of this so i will use a less coarse auburn net and work my way through so i will be back okay so here it is i just sanded it and i buffed it lightly against my clothing and it's just sort of shiny enough i didn't want it like really really shiny so uh, let's take a look at this sample because I think I will use it in the same sort of necklace. What you see here is the actual donut uh, between two bead caps. And then of course, these are clay as well. Now this I made with uh, this bronze colored embossing powder and it worked really well. I can't find it. As I said, I probably made this 10 years ago at least, maybe even more. So somewhere in my studio or in my barn, there is uh, this bronze colored powder. Of course, because it's embossing powder, it, it melted. So it melted right there on the clay and it's really a nice sturdy finish. It does not peel off. Uh, it doesn't crack off. It's not going to go anywhere. Now, if you've used polymer for a little while, you know that there are several ways to impart a real metallic look to your clay. One would be a foil, another is leaf, and then uh, this is what we're doing right now, which is simply acrylic paint. Now, the other two, uh, the leaf and the foil, give a much more metallic look. I mean, it has a real... It looks just like metal like this. Whereas, of course, paint doesn't have quite the same metallic look to it. But if you use leaf and foil, they are more fragile. You can actually kind of chip them off the surface. And so um, they're, they're a lot less durable. So we're gonna use paint. Here's my acrylic paint. And I have rolled my black clay or dark, dark, dark gray clay through about setting number five of my pasta machine. So it's not terribly thick. Now I'm going to make these. Mm, I think I'll make them larger. Should have been better prepared. Now this cutter is what I use to make these. And let's just string them on. So you can see, I'm just going to take my cord, go through, go through the hole, and then, of course, come and go through the other one. So you can see what that looks like on the side, right? Like so. Now, 
The thing about this is uh, when it's strong, these little guys are going to ride up. You see how it's not centered? This is more or less centered. I can move these two down a bit and you can see that there is a place where they're more centered on the hole. But because the hole is large, what is happening here is when I string them, gravity pulls the piece down and these little bead caps are actually higher than center. Now, I hadn't really thought about this before, but were I to do it again, and if I wanted these to be absolutely as close to centered on the B like this, as opposed to riding up like this, then I would have made this hole exactly two millimeters, right? Because this cord rides up in the hole. So the cord itself is situated above the centermost point in the B. And that's why, of course, this is going to ride up and not sit perfectly centered on the piece. Doesn't really much matter to me though, so I'm gonna continue. Now these are the ones I made. Now they're gonna ride up. So there is a limitation as far as how big this could be. I certainly don't want a bead cap that's sitting like above and over um, and over the donut. So let's see. Will I have a problem if I increase the size? Actually, this looks to be the same size. This is larger. You know, I, th I feel that that is too large. I think that a bead cap of that diameter would end up way up here. So, you know what? I'm going to stick with the same size. Which is these. Look, I have two of them. Okay. So now, I'm going to cut two. And now I have a decision to make as to the curvature of the bead cap itself. See, that's kind of a nice curve. I like it. And it was made by taking these little discs and putting them on this paint mixing tray. Let me lift this a bit so that you can see what the curvature of each of the little compartments in the tray is. This is the right side, this is the wrong side. So if I use this, I will get that same curvature, like so, right? Like that. Now I have another form and this is actually something I got in a Chinese grocery store. And I think it's for dim sum. It's for like putting food in. And there was actually a rod here and a handle. But I didn't want that, so I took it off. So I also use this when I want to make slightly dished forms, not really flat. But it is not as extreme. I don't know if you can see, it's getting hard. I don't have quite enough room, but let me turn it so you can see that it's almost flat, almost flat, not quite. So I'm going to go back to my paint tray. Oops. Back to my paint tray. And I will just gently Put this on. Like so. Okay, so I like the texture of these. Um, that's optional. You can certainly make it totally smooth without texture at all. But I prefer something a little more textured. So I'm just going to take this, and this is iridescent rich gold uh, acrylic paint. It's Liquitex. And I just dab the paint right on the clay. Now, this may freak out some people, 
I um, I used to use a lot of iron oxide and someone I know was very upset that I used my fingers. So if you want to use a brush, you certainly can use a brush too. I guess in certain paints, you've got these organic materials that probably should not be touched. So I would just, if that is a concern to you, I would definitely Google and find out. I tend not to do this all that much. I don't find my fingers in paint very often, actually. Okay, so now this will go directly into the oven and it will be cured. And then after that, I will drill a hole in the middle. So I'll be back. Okay, so here are the pieces we're gonna need for this very simple necklace. You're going to need 29 of these discs, whoops, 30 spacer, two beads, one, um, bead cap, your focal point. Then going the other way, you're gonna need the opposite. You're gonna need your one bead cap, 30 spacer, two beads, and you're gonna need 29 of the discs. So let's make uh, the discs first. Okay, so let's make the discs. Now you have to make 116 of these. So you really want to make the process as streamlined and as efficient as possible. Because let's say you make these and you just cut them out and put them on, um, on the paint tray and then you have to put holes in them later. Well, that's 116 holes you have to drill. That's, you know, it's fine to drill a few, but when you get into those kind of numbers, well, I'm sorry, but you probably don't want to do that. You've got better things to do with your time. All right, so this is clay uh, that I've rolled through setting number five on my pasta machine because these individual discs certainly do not need to be very thick. So I've rolled them through, and this is clay that I mixed using scrap and blackout. Uh, it's not completely, totally black. You can probably see that. And there's a comparison between the two. But for purposes of demonstration, this is just fine. All right, so I'm going to take... Actually, I think I'll work on a little piece of paper. Okay, and this paper's been used for other things, but it's fine. All right, so here is the cutter. I'm just going to cut the shapes out. Right. This has a little bit of gold. I'll set that aside. All right, so you get the picture. You just keep cutting these, these discs. Now, this is um, something that's used in electronics, and you can find these for sale online. I think Vernon and I sold them. I don't know if we still have them, but uh, the set came with a lot of different sizes, very, very tiny ones, uh, up to some that were actually larger than this. And this is something that's used for audio files, I think, use them. I'm not exactly sure. Anyway, it's, this is a very good diameter. It's slightly larger than the two millimeters that I am going to be threading the whole necklace on. So what I'm gonna do is just try to find the center. Pierce. And there's no ejecting mechanism. So as I cut, it's just pushing the clay farther up into the piece. So now I have three little discs in there and I'll keep cutting and they'll be expelled out of the other end. All right. But doing this means I don't have to drill them. Now I'm just going to take center them on. My paint tray. The back of my paint tray. Okay. And 
just ease them onto the tray. You know, we're taking something that's perfectly flat and we're encouraging it to drape over the paint tray, which is of course curved. Like so. Now, of course, I'll fill the tray up and cure it. Now, I'm not going to use the other side. It's really dirty. Uh, because, of course, it, it gets shiny. I don't really want them shiny. So this is the side that was actually against the paint tray, like so. And you can see that the metal uh, made the clay very shiny. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to have to do every single one of them like this, okay? So fill the trays and start baking these. Next, we're going to make the tube beads. So I'll be back. Okay, we're gonna make tube beads now. So what's the purpose of the tube beads? The tube beads are actually strung in between each disc so that the dip discs don't collapse tightly on themselves like, like this, for instance. You know, these are a little misshapen somehow, but um, you, you get some spacing. They're spaced out because of these little tube beads. Now, of course, the longer the tube bead, the more uh, widely separated the discs are. But anyway, that's the purpose. So that there's some air in between each of the discs, okay? So they're very simple to make. What you're gonna need to do is select uh, a very straight tool like this knitting needle, which is a little warped, that's okay. But the diameter should be uh, larger than uh, the material you're gonna be stringing on. So I'm using two millimeter cord. So this is larger than two millimeters. So I don't have to drill the holes out and I'll just be able to slide these on because I'm making a tube bead and that's automatically making the hole in the bead. Okay, so here's my clay. I just rolled it into a little cylinder. Uh, it is not black as you can see it doesn't matter maybe it'll be a little easier to see actually so I'm going to take my knitting needle and I'm going to pierce straight through the center like so I'm going to turn it over and repeat from the other side so now I have a hole right through the center of the cylinder with my fingers I'm going to start closing the clay around the knitting needle at one end, and then I'm going to flip it over and repeat on the other side, like so. Now tube beads are very simple. Tube beads are simple to make, but you can get into trouble with them. And the way you do that is by pressing too hard when you're rolling the clay around the needle. If you press too hard, what happens is the hole keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's really not what you want. So you're always gonna roll lightly against your work surface. And as you lightly roll, you'll see that the clay starts moving out this way, okay? Now, these do not have to be very, uh, very big. They can be very small diameter because their only purpose is really to separate the discs. And the holes in the discs are only, well, you saw how large they are. They're not very big. So something like this is certainly not going to go through the holes in the discs. Okay, so just keep rolling. And it's like uh, reducing. When you're reducing a round cane, you just keep rolling. You take your hands, you place them in the middle of the mass, and you start moving your hands toward the ends. Okay. And remember, lightly roll. If you roll too heavy, 
if we use too much force, that hole is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that is not what you want. Okay, so every now and then I find that I need to tighten the clay at the ends again. Then I'll twist it a little and then I'll stretch. And you know what this stretching does? You guys probably remember toys. Well, we had them as a, as a child. I may be older than most of you, but there was this Chinese woven thing and you stuck your fingers in the end, but when, and it was loose, but when you pulled that weave just tightened around your, and you couldn't get your fingers out. Well, in a way, that's what I'm doing here when I am taking the ends and twisting and pulling, pulling. Because I'm actually making the hole smaller and more snug around the knitting needle. Okay, and I'll keep rolling until I achieve the diameter I want which, as I said, is quite small. But for our purposes, you're going to want, of course, you're gonna to have to do this more than once, and you are definitely going to want to try to make them the same diameter. You know, it's probably not critical that they be the same diameter, but... Why not? They certainly don't have to be exactly the same, but close, close is probably a good thing. Okay. Just keep moving it out and moving it out. And these look pretty small, but they're not really, not compared to the ones on my table. You see how much smaller that is? So I would say I have to go quite a bit further to reduce it to that size. Every now and then I twist and then roll. You know, if anything, I have found that I have the opposite problem. You know, the hole doesn't get big. The hole tends to get small. If I wanted to increase the size, I would just increase the pressure as I'm rolling, and I think that will push the clay away from the needle, and in that way, increase and enlarge the hole itself. But every now and then, I've gotta spin this and get it moving. Maybe I can just pull it on one end stretch it out a bit, stretch it out on the other side. And roll to smooth. Okay, let's do the same thing. I'm gonna loosen it up a bit. And as I'm twisting, I'm actually twisting the needle. I'm gonna start pulling and stroking the clay on the rod. Okay. Not the most exciting thing to do when clay is it, but it is necessary. Unless you happen to have, let's say, some inexpensive beads that you might want to use instead. And, you know, if you need to save time more than, let's say, money, then you might choose something like an e-bead. There are Japanese e-beads with a nice matte finish, and they have very large holes. And I have strung them on my two millimeter cord. 
So by no means are two beads the only thing or the only option open to you. It is just, I think, an economical way to solve the problem. Okay, so I'm not gonna roll anymore. I could continue to roll. I think this is still smaller, but I'm getting much closer to the size I want. But it gets a little boring. You're just watching me do this. <laughs> so, you know, I think I'll stop. All right, so let me take my mark set, and this is a five millimeter. Mine is five millimeters. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that five millimeter side. Maybe it's easier to see here. And I'm just going to press it right up against the raw clay. And I've just transferred. Oh, I transferred the wrong size. Okay. So I have to do it so I can see it. Sorry. Here is the five millimeter side. I'm going to take the five millimeter side and push it up against the tube bead. Okay, so if you do that, just roll it, re-roll it. And uh, okay, so there are the marks. Let me see if I can, let me see if I can show you, there they are. All right, now you don't cut it now. We're gonna bake it and then we're gonna cut it after it's cured. So I'm gonna mark the rest of it. And then this will go in my oven. Now, since I'm making so many, I might try to get this off by loosening it a bit and sliding it off and curing it straight. Okay. I did a really good job getting this clay on here, but it's coming off. Okay, and perhaps I should have removed it before I pressed, I made the impressions. Okay, so this is gonna be cured. And um, it's not gonna be the most perfect one I've done because I still have those three millimeter marks. But as you can see, the way these are arranged, you don't really see much of them when you're wearing them. And of course, being that dark color, you'll see it even less. So I'm gonna pop this in the oven and then I will be back. All right, so the two bead is out of the oven and it's cool. I trimmed the two ends and now you're just gonna take a nice, sharp, stiff blade. Here, I'm back. I'm gonna clean my blade. And you're just going to find the marks. Find the mark. And right at the mark, just cut straight down. Okay, so it's that simple. Like so, and you have nice, neat cuts on your tube beads. So of course, you know, you could make these very thin and make hishi beads, you can make lots of different things. Okay, so I'm gonna set these aside. Now let's talk about stringing. Now I have strung these my two millimeter cord and you know of course the way i've strung them they're all curved the same way and i like this look because it, it's a solid look right when you put it together it looks quite solid but it's also airy because the the um discs have been separated by these little these little guys but there's nothing to say you can't do this for instance let me just take two off here. And let's just put one here and then put one going the other way. So you end up with something that looks more like this. 
right? So, you know, I have just chosen to string them this way because I like this look, but you can certainly play around with the arrangement. Okay, so you're just going to alternate the two bead with a disc like that. And now it's time to do the center. Now I'm going to take the bead cap and string it on the same way. Then I will string on the donut, then the bead cap on the other side of the donut, like so. So there you go. That's what it's going to look like. Now this is quite a bit larger than the uh, other one you can see. Here is the original one, so you can see that this one's quite a bit smaller. So once I string this and actually hold it against me, I might decide to make it a little bit longer because you see, this is going to sit that high off of my skin, whereas this is maybe, well, you can see the difference. So this is going to sit quite a bit higher up off my skin. And maybe I don't want it as a choker. Maybe it's going to have to drop a little bit farther just for comfort, but we'll see when we get there. Okay, so I'm going to continue stringing and then I'll be back. Okay, we're now ready to put the clasp on. And I made one of my little hook clasps and on top it's just a mass of clay and then a textured piece of black on top. So it's very plain but it will sit like this, okay? Or actually like this. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I am going to take an O-ring, slide it on my forceps, and then slide it on. Now, Cindy Tag taught me how to do that. Before then, I was just struggling trying to get these on. It was very difficult, but she taught me how to do that. Okay, then I'm going to glue the cord right into the hook. I'm just using a Loctite gel glue. And I've started just buying these tiny tubes because um, I got tired of my glue going bad. And... Um, CA glue, you have to keep away from sunlight and, you know, it dries out. And particularly if you travel, you don't want to carry a huge bottle of glue with you because invariably TSA will open it. And I don't mean to insult TSA, but more times than I care to mention, my glue has been opened and not put together properly. And uh, then I just have a mess. Okay, so what I did there was I just glued that O-ring to the bottom of the hook. So the cord, two millimeter solid cord, is glued inside the hook. And then the O-ring is glued to the outside. Now let's move all of this down. And secure the other end. Okay. All right, like so. And I did put a few extra pieces on. And you might have to do that because, and I'll tell you why. The original hook that I used is this. And it's it's okay, I mean, it, it's fine. But uh, it is actually longer than this and also the way it's secured there's there's a loop i'll show you i have to create a loop a loop and then it goes back in like so so see how much this clasp takes up it's very long and um my little hook clasp takes up much less space as you can see, much less. All right, so before you put your uh, your clasp on, of course, you're going to try it on without the clasp. You put it around your neck, 
and um, then you figure out how much how much you would like your hook or your clasp to take up. And, and this one is very small, whereas the other one was very large. So I had to add a few pieces. So you'll figure that out. All right, now it's time to hook the other side. Once again, I'm gonna put an O-ring on, slide it all the way down. like so. And now let's figure out how deeply I'm going to go in. I did drill in and it's that far. So it's approximately there. So let me cut. Like so. Once again, I'm going to take my glue. I'm going to put it in the hole. And ideally, I should have a little bit around the outside of the hole for that O-ring. Now I'm going to push it in. And then I'm going to push that O-ring right up against. And I've left a little bit of play, just a little bit. See, there's just... A tiny bit and there we have it so now the necklace is done let the glue dry and probably by eh, sometime later tonight I could wear it but I am NOT going anywhere so I'm not going to okay so there is today's tutorial just a really simple little necklace with a very, very simple uh, imitative, imitative polymer thing made with embossing powders. So thank you very much for tuning in, for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned something from it. And I hope you'll subscribe and maybe you'll even like it. And I would appreciate that very much. So until we meet again, I'm Donna Cato. Goodbye.